that's been. Uh, without uh, further ado, just wanted to introduce Oliver Day for Securing Change. Hello. Uh, so hi, my name is Oliver Day. Uh, I founded a nonprofit recently called Securing Change, and uh, today I'm going to walk you through uh, where we've been, where we've come from, uh, what we're going to do in the future, and talk to you about some of our uh, future projects and volunteer opportunities, which is why I'm glad there are so many people in this room. Um, all right, so Securing Change uh, has a mission to provide digital security to agents of change. Uh, agents of change is a term that I borrowed from Peter Drucker. And uh, Drucker wrote about nonprofits as uh, entities that are trying to make the world a better place. Now, this is in contrast to a for profit whose only goal is to maximize shareholder value. Now, if, uh, if you look at the IRS, they've got at least a million different nonprofits registered. Uh, a fraction of those have a budget, an operational budget that is over $100,000. Now that $100,000 has to cover their rent, their salary, their infrastructure, any software, hardware, uh, and most of them can barely afford the first three of those things. So enter securing change, right? This is why we're here. We want to help those guys with security because they cannot afford it. If, uh, if you followed Wendy Nather, she has a term called the security poverty line, right? And that is to have a decent security defense. You need to have a certain set of core technologies purchased, configured, and operated by staff. And if you don't have uh, this certain dollar figure, and I think for, for her it was like a thousand person organization, uh, and it was around like $50,000. Uh, so maybe for smaller nonprofits, that, that number is going to be a little bit lower. But all the same, most of these guys barely have an IT budget, and their security budget is zero. Uh, so this is what we're trying to work with. People that have a security budget of zero, but have just as many adversaries uh, as Fortune 500 companies. So in essence, we're trying to lower that security poverty line by offering solutions and services that uh, are going to be in this price range. So we have a different type of revenue model. Our revenue model is pay what you can. Now, you might, as an organization, only be able to afford zero dollars. That's fine. We can work with that. We're more than happy to do pro bono work. Most of my directors uh, are trying to convince me uh, of this other side, which is we can actually charge some people some amount of money. Because uh, if you look at uh, Form 990s, which is what uh, uh, Nonprofits have to uh, file with the IRS every year. Some nonprofit executives make upwards of $300,000 a year. It's a very small fraction, but they do exist. So for those guys, I think we can still charge some amount of money. And for those of you who have worked with the security industry, you'll know that $75 per hour is a pittance uh, in our world, right? Most charge between $100 and $400 an hour. But this allows us to have a very small fraction of our clients underwrite and subsidize the work that we do for those who live far below the security poverty line. So you might ask, well, how, how, like, how are you going to uh, be able to offer so many people pro bono security uh, if only a fraction of them are willing to pay? Uh, and that is a great question. And that's where you guys come in. Uh, that's why I'm so glad you're now a captive audience. Uh, I need volunteers, okay? I need people that can come in and do one of two things right now. Uh, the first thing is security scanning. This is something that I think most of us have the capability of doing. Uh, and this is um, running Nessus or whatever tool you happen to like, uh, W3AF, whatever, uh, on these different uh, websites. For the most part, I'm, I'm focusing on website security. Uh, it's the most visible for any organization and uh, even the smallest organization with like five people will generally have a public facing internet site. Um, so think about that, it's, it's viewable to the entire world, any bad guy can reach it, um, and they don't have any money to secure it. So coming in, running just a simple security scan against this, and then explaining it to the security, to the executive directors of these nonprofits, that's a huge thing that I need right now. Um, 
What's fun about this is that you have to be creative, right? I, for how many people have done this type of work professionally, just security scanning? All right, there's a small portion of the room. Now, usually when you explain things to your client, you say, well, okay, you need to buy the following things, you need to get some staff in place. None of those solutions are gonna work here. You have to be creative. Sometimes the solutions that I've come up with are we need to get you a robust, automatic backup system so the next time you are attacked you can recover in under an hour and not have to spend a thousand dollars on someone to come in and recreate your WordPress website from scratch right this is the type of solution that I need people that think outside the box that can come up with solutions they can cobble together scripts this is what we need it's again it's challenging you have to be creative um, The next thing I need are people to come in and do incident response. Uh, we do get calls where the attacks are ongoing. Sometimes it's fine, it's just, you know, some dude that's selling Viagra or whatever took over the WordPress website. It's not a big deal, it's not scary at all, right? But sometimes, right, one of the things, one of the classes of businesses or organizations that falls under agents of change is the NGO or the non government organization. These are People like Human Rights in China, they have very scary adversaries. When they're getting attacked, it is not just to sell Viagra. People's lives are literally on the line and they don't have any money either. So we need people to come in, answer the red phone when they're getting attacked, during the attack, maybe even afterwards, come in, go through the incident response process, help them expel the attacker, get their defenses back up, show them what they did wrong, and again, you, you, you're going to have to come up with creative solutions here. Um, but these are the two main things. Uh, I would say the most common uh, incident response that we're, we're having so far and that I predict in the future will just be website breaches. So uh, if you guys have ever heard the term uh, drive-by download, this is a, a term coined by Niels Provost from, uh, from Google. Uh, this is just where you know, somebody somehow lost control of their website. Maybe their webmaster's uh, laptop got popped. So now the FTP password is in the hands of the attacker and they're just uploading uh, iframes and obfuscated JavaScript to the website. This is the most common. It's pretty simple to go through. You rotate everyone's passwords. You ask them if they have a clean backup to restore from. Try not to roll your eyes when they say they don't have a clean backup to restore from. And, and you know, work with them. You're, you're going to have to go through and you know, probably go through source code, find where all the bad stuff is, pull it out. It's pretty simple to do. If you don't know how to do it, I'm more than happy to train you. Uh, other things, oh, sorry, oops. Other things that we do, uh, if you're local to the client, uh, we go in, we look through their computers, we look for root kits. Um, if they don't have certain types of defenses in there, we go ahead and install it for them. Uh, this can be stuff like Komodo or, you know, um, uh, little snitch just to see when outbound connections are coming up, but then also follow up coming back three and six months later to see if they've disabled everything because it's annoying and they do that a lot. Um, so it's, it's, it's nice because we aren't getting paid and so we don't have to worry about whether or not it affects our bottom line. If you're too busy as the, the initial volunteer, we can just reassign a new one. Uh, this is the model that I'm hoping for. All right, so that's where we came from. That's what we're doing right now. Uh, so hopefully some of you are interested in this stuff. Um, next, I wanna tell, uh, talk to you guys about where we're going. Some of the stuff that I've been thinking about that I'm gonna build in probably the next six months. Um, the first is a mirroring service. Uh, so part of this is that uh, these guys tend not to have backups, right? They just, they're really bad at it. Um, they don't understand the power of it. So uh, I was really inspired by the EFF's mirroring project. They just had a page that showed wget, and this is what wget does. These are the command switches that will make a static copy of your entire website. Uh, I want to take that to the next step uh, and offer all agents of change the ability to have us automatically capture static copies of their website. So worst case, DDoS knocks them out or someone infects their website, we can provide them with a clean static copy of their website that they can put back online while they figure out how, how to deal with their issues. Um, that's version one. Version one's pretty simple. It's gonna be what wget plus cron plus probably a git repository. 
uh, version two will be backing up the actual source, right? The server-side source code, their PHP, their database, that's gonna be a little trickier because now I either have to store their credentials, which I really don't wanna do, or I have to hand out credentials, which again, I really don't wanna do, but we'll work it out. We'll figure something out. This is the project that I'm really excited about. Uh, a lot of my life right now is, is, is whatever I am, executive director or whatever for this organization is writing grants. And so this is the one that I'm really hoping is gonna hit home with some of these grant make making agencies uh, and, and we might be able to get some money from that one. Uh, the next one, this came from a conversation with my first client where I was like, hey, so if I can set up automated logs for you, would you actually or someone in your organization look at them? And he looked at me and he was like, you know, that's literally the least important sounding thing I could do on any given day. <laughs> and I was like, that's, that's really comforting. Thanks, Chris. That's, that's awesome. So, but it, it inspired me because what we can do is just make a collective security operations center, right? I've talked with a guy at Splunk, at least that time, maybe he was drunk, he sounded really enthusiastic about the idea of giving me a license, and we can just collect all of their server logs. Uh, if, they, if they have uh, you know, uh, antivirus or whatever, we can have all that stuff coming into one of our secure servers and then have volunteers go through that stuff and look for actual threats. And the reason I think this is gonna be really powerful is that we'll see attacks coming in over multiple organizations and we'll see patterns that maybe no one else is gonna see. Um, this one's a little scarier and trickier because now I'm exposing people who I might not know personally because I'm gonna have to really build a volunteer organization for this uh, to look at logs which may or may not be sensitive, right? There's, this is gonna require a little bit more thought um, but I'm really excited about the core of the idea. Okay, so I wanted to leave enough time for questions, so hopefully there are some. If not, I'm gonna pitch you guys on something else. So, uh, questions, yes. We currently have three clients, which I know is not an impressive number. I, I come from Vermont, so that's huge. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, since roughly October of 2012. Uh, it took me a while to figure out how to form a 501c3 corporation. By the way, we're still not, right? It's tricky. So we're recognized by the state of Massachusetts as a nonprofit, which means we can operate. If someone sues us, they can take whatever assets I have in the organization, which is pretty much zero. Um, but they can't sue us personally, which is important. Um, the rest of it was building infrastructure. I just finished getting the website up email, uh, and I, I've set up a request tracker. I don't know if you guys know what that is. It's a fantastic ticketing system. So now if, you, if someone writes an email to help at rt.securingchange.org, a ticket is automatically generated. I can bring in volunteers and scale it without just doing it on a spreadsheet, which would just fail in like five hours. Um, I'm still working on getting more clients. That's really one of the more challenging things for me. You would think offering a free service would be super easy. It's really not. <laughs> um, I had to get letters of recommendation from my first client. He just didn't know who I was, didn't want to trust me with the security. So I kind of understand it. I think once we get out there a little bit more and instead of me talking to, and no offense to you guys, but instead of just talking to my cohorts, my, my own peoples, I need to get out into the nonprofit world. There are actually nonprofit conferences. Those are the ones that once I'm starting to talk to those guys, I think the clients are gonna start coming in in droves. Um, the follow-up question, which I'm hoping you're gonna have, is how many volunteers do we have? Currently, 14. That's how many we have. And so I'm hoping with this room, we can at least double that number of volunteers. Yes? Is there a minimum required? One per month. One per month. Oh, wh how many? <laughs> he wanted to know what the minimum level of commitment is. I'm just making up a snarky answer. I would say one hour per month is probably the minimum where you can do anything worthwhile. And I mean, literally with one hour, I think what you could do is if someone else ran a vulnerability scan but didn't have time to explain it to them, you could look at it and go, okay, false positive, false positive. No one cares about that. No one's going to do that. Okay, this one's important and then either email the guy or gal and, you know, or talk to him over Skype, whatever. Like, it's not like at stake or, you know, uh, Anderson or whatever they're called now, where you have to fly out and meet with the guy. We're doing everything cheap so you can Skype, talk to him over the phone, whatever. I think in an hour you can pull that off. You know, I, again, I guess my concern would be like, 
I could commit maybe five hours one weekend because I have a but then it might be you know you get busy with work. Like sure. A week or two before I do anything. Sure. Yeah, and it's actually it's like I've worked in enough consulting organizations. I know how it's supposed to be, but when it's all volunteers, when you guys are giving me your time, it's really more challenging because people are like, "Dude, I my actual work needs me right now." Uh, so what I've been doing is sort of redundancy uh, issues, right? So I'll, I'll assign two volunteers to one client, and they're a team, and they switch on and off as they both have free time. And if one needs to drop off, fine, that's fine. We have another guy right there, and if he needs to drop off, well, as soon as the one drops off, I'm gonna reassign someone else. And it's not, it's not anything personal, I know how it is, but you know, we're gonna have two people at all time just so that the client is never just you know, staring into silence uh, and, and waiting for someone to get back to him or her. Uh, any other questions? Yes? Yeah, this is gonna be an ongoing issue, right? So uh, right now I'm just tapping people out of my personal network, so I know what their skill set is. Um, I did a call for volunteers, and I got like two people. This is just over the internet, just blindly. I was surprised anyone said anything. Uh, and basically like, I just, I, I took a project that I knew, like they needed someone to come in and just do a, a scan of the website. And so I just said, here, do this. If you said you can do it, do it. Um, and you know, one of them didn't come back to me at all, and I was like, okay, I'm just going to write that person off. It's kind of flaky. And the other one came back, and it was, you know, there was a lot of false positives in there that they didn't really figure out yet. Eh, you know, so we we had. It's going to be, it's going to be difficult. It's something I really need to uh, work on a little bit more. Um, I, I think really what it's going to be is you're going to get assigned something. If you fail, you're going to lose karma points. If you do awesome at it, you're going to you know, build karma points. And I'll probably have tiers of volunteers, like people that Oliver knows directly, people that Oliver has worked with a few times and have done an awesome job, and then down and down and down, right, to like, you just met Oliver on the internet, and now you're volunteering. Um, but it is scary for me too, right, because I have to trust random people from the internet uh, who want to help. So uh, I'm going to have to figure out a tier of services that those random people can do. I, I like more people that I've met in person that I know that I have a relationship with. Um, one of the other ideas that uh, I'm working on is uh, going to ISC Squared. I know it's a very divisive organization, but they have 75,000 people with certificates. I want to make Securing Change able to offer CPE credits to those people, so that way when you know, they're trying to earn enough credits for their, their certificate renewal, they can do that and, and do good for us as well, right? And, and I think having an organization back someone will sort of up them in the tiers of people. Like, you know, whether or not they're good or not, at least someone's backing their name um, with an organization. So I know ISSA is here as well. I've been talking with the president of the LA chapter so I really want to get into these bigger organizations and find ways to harness all of their members um, so I'm not just putting out random calls on the internet and asking for people to come help me. Yes? Uh, so what's the criteria for accepting bias at all? And then if there's a bias going here, can they just say, I'm not going yes. to do with that, that company? Absolutely. Um, so there's two, there, so the first one, the first one that I came up with, and sh I probably shouldn't be saying this because it's being recorded, um, you cannot be a hate group, okay? If you are a hate-based organization, we're, we're not going to advocate that people hack you, but we're just, we're not going to help you, right? I would probably call this the Westboro Baptist Church rule if I could, but I'm not going to, not publicly anyway. But if you think about it, they are a nonprofit. They're a church. And they, in their twisted minds, think they're making the world a better place. I just disagree with them. Now, I can't say, well, Oliver doesn't want that and it's just not going to happen. I have to make rules that make sense, that anybody can step in if I get hit by a bus or my board's like, dude, that guy is crazy, get him out of here, and a new president gets uh, appointed, that those rules can still be applied in a very equitable manner. So if you're a hate-based organization, if you advocate hate, or violence, or bigotry, you're on your own, figure out security, I'm sure you can hire someone on your, your, your own. Um, political groups are also kind of tricky, right? Uh, the IRS has rules about nonprofit status, that you cannot directly lobby or directly support lobbying. 
I have uh, a legal team that is looking into whether or not I can help people. But like uh, someone asked me the question, like, well, if the Tea Party came and said, hey, do you, can you help us? Would you? And I was like, well, I might not personally help them. But if we have volunteers that are like, yeah, I'm totally fine with that, then sure. Again, with political groups, I have to find out if it's even legally possible for us because we are going to be a 501c3 soon. We have a law firm on retainer. As soon as I raise $2,500, I can pay them. They're going to file the paperwork for us. By the way, that's uh, the site for our donation. Uh, if you want to help out, right there, donate.html. Um, right now, not tax deductible. As soon as we file our paperwork, it is retroactively tax deductible. Um, the reason that I'm really interested, not only because of the tax donation stuff, uh, to be a 501c3, if you've ever heard of TechSoup, probably, well, some of you, wow, some of you actually have. We want to do something like what they're doing. Uh, a lot of software companies will offer free licenses if you're a 501c3. I want to be the united way of that, and for security licenses, hardware, I want to aggregate those licenses and then distribute them to other agents of change on their behalf, so take out all the paperwork for them, but also make sure that they're configured properly. TechSoup, I love those guys, don't get me wrong, but they just throw the license over the wall, they're like, here's some Microsoft Office, go. With security stuff, it's gotta be configured properly, so I wanna be able to send people in with the licenses, make sure they're installed, configured, come back three to six months later, make sure they're still configured properly. Um, okay, so I think I might be running out of time. I think I'm actually over. Uh, so if you want to volunteer, this is the email address. Uh, I have a table somewhere back there. Uh, come find me. Um, any more questions before I go? All right, thank you very much. <laughs>